Uh, so, ma'am, with your due permissions, shall we start? Yes, let us. Okay, ma'am. Uh, good morning, Professor Alaka Sharma, ma'am. Honorary, Honorable Honorary Director, International Center for Gandhian Studies, USTM, and today's esteemed keynote speaker, Sri Mahbubul Haq, sir, Honorable Chancellor, University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya, participants of the program, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya, we would welcome all to the eighth lecture of the USTM webinar lecture series, organized to discuss the various aspects, issues, and challenges of higher education during this testing time. And today, especially, we are going to talk about the future of higher education and higher education scenario 2050. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody, like, you know, we are all aware of Professor Alaka Sharma, ma'am, but still, I would like to say a few words about her. Our speaker today, Alaka Sharma, ma'am, is the Honorary Director of International Center for Gandhian Studies, USTM, and she's also the Commissioner of Pranam Government of Assam, the founder and editor of Akshar Foundation. The former two-time MLA uh, representing Nalbari District in the Assam State Assembly, uh, ma'am, is an eminent uh, and a renowned social reformer, and we are indeed honored to have such an uh, esteemed personality with us today speaking uh, for the uh, webinar. Before we begin, I would like to request all the participants to kindly mute their microphones during the Participants can put queries in the chat box and uh, in the question answer box. Selected queries will be taken up for discussion, taking into account the time factor. All the participants to kindly fill up the feedback form. The link of the feedback form will be shared at the end of this session. Each certificate will be the feedback form. Uh, so without uh, going any further, I would now like to request Professor Alaka, ma'am, to kindly uh, take on the session, ma'am. Thank you very much, Mahjabeen, for a generous introduction. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today's topic is education scenario or higher education scenario in 2050. Now, first of all, it is uh, very imperative for all of us to know that the technology is changing at such a rapid rate that it is very difficult to extrapolate what will be the situation in the year 2050. So for us to imagine what will be the scenario in 2050 is very difficult, but at the same time, let us try to visualize what will be the situation. Now, let us see a glimpse of the Chandrayaan 2 is India's second lunar exploration mission. The mission is planned to use GSLV MK3 to launch an orbiter, lander, and a rover to the orbit and the southern pole of the moon, respectively, taking a fuel efficient path utilizing the moon's gravitational pull. So, let us explore more about the journey and the objectives of Chandrayaan 2.
Now, this augmented reality and the virtual reality has changed the entire scenario of education. And as one can see, the classroom has a student who is not present in the classroom itself. The person is present in the hospital bed and still we can see the person in the classroom and we can see that the person is able to listen to the lecture. So the question here is that in the year 2050, will we be able to cope with this kind of scenario by the time we reach 2050? These are the important questions which we must try to analyze. And I would like to say one thing that from the beginning, from the kindergarten till now, or from the primary education till now, the entire education scenario is undergoing a rapid change. Can you, Mazamin, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Loud and clear. Okay. From the from primary education till the higher education, the entire education scenario is undergoing a rapid change. Of course, in India, we are still bothered about the admission rate and the retention rate. Uh, but now slowly the question of uh, learning outcome has come into the picture. And with that learning outcome, what content are we teaching that becomes very important? For example, in the higher education, we say that the gross enrollment ratio must increase. The question is the gross enrollment ratio will increase, but mere increase in GER is not going to equip our students for the future for which we are preparing. Now, any system of higher education, any system, any institution of higher education prepares the student either for a job in self-employment or prepares the student for getting engaged, getting employed somewhere. The problem here is that the technology is rising, technology is changing at such an exponential rate that the education system, the institutions of education should be able to keep pace with the changes in the technology. And I would like to mention here that uh, the government of India and the U University Grant Commission, they are trying their best to integrate the educational institution at the national level. We have the concept of choice-based credit system, whereby the academic credits given to the students in different universities can be exchanged, can be compared. And a student can uh, go for some credits in a particular institution and acquire certain other credits from other institutions. That kind of situation is possible. And even at the world level, uh, governments are trying, different governments, coordination committees are trying that we kind of integrate the whole educational system. And we have this world ranking of the universities, attempts are being made to standardize the courses so that it is possible to exchange credit. The question is, are these efforts enough to keep pace with technology? And at this point, I must say that self-finance institutions like USTN are in a much better position in the sense that we are flexible enough to design our own syllabus, to, to change our syllabus, to make it up to date with the state of art technology. We are also enabled to design new courses which are relevant to the situation. But most of the government institutions are bogged down by the rate tapism. So they, are, they have even less flexibility. My point today is that we must understand the impact of the changing technology on the education system. And the presentation, which I'm going to give now, gives you a, some, a little glimpse of things to come. And as I said, it is extremely difficult to imagine the scenario in 2050. But let us try to understand the whole situation from, from a futuristic perspective. And as we saw in the first video, the whole, the whole experience of Chandrayaan is being experienced by all the students as if they themselves have landed on the moon. One student who is not present in the classroom, but is sitting in the hospital bed, he can enjoy, he can access the education that is being imparted. And the fact 
that we are interacting with each other, though most of us are uh, so far away from each other. So this, is, this itself is a virtual medium. And this virtual medium has enabled us to interact, to transmit information, to share knowledge, to share wisdom. So coming days will be marked by the exponential growth of technology. And we must try to understand the situation from the futuristic viewpoint. So let us try to understand the same. Now, one of the main goals of primary education and the higher education is to prepare the students with skills and attributes. Mind here, skills and attributes that will enable him or her to develop an enterprise or to be gainfully engaged. Now, we have to visualize the, the jobs. We have to visualize the assignments that don't even exist yet. And we have to design our education institutions to train the students for that. Let me give you an example. Uh, when India became independent, nearly 80% or 90% of the people were engaged in farming. Today, less than 30% people are engaged in farming. So what happened to the 60%? So 60% of the people, at least most of them, have managed to find some jobs somewhere because the emerging economy provided different kinds of jobs. Similarly, in USA, there was a point when 90% of the people were involved in farming, but now less than 2% are engaged in farming. That doesn't mean that farming as an occupation has reduced the job opportunities. That doesn't mean that we have unemployment in US because of this. So the emerging jobs, the new jobs that are coming up and the new jobs that have the potential to come up that we must be able to have a look at. And dear friends, I would like to pinpoint at this point that if you Google search, you will find many, many videos that tell you the 15 jobs that will be outdated in the next 10, 15 years, the 15 jobs that will have potential after 20 years and so on. There are many interesting videos and you can just have a look at it if you are interested in pursuing this matter. But at the moment, since this is a lecture organized on a distinguished platform of USTM, I would not go into all those aspects. They are readily available on the Google. I would like to provide a basic framework with which we can analyze, with which the analysis of the futuristic needs becomes possible. So here are the trends. One is automation, the other is environmental remediation, new theories of mind, and new education technology. So let us discuss these aspects one by one. Now, as far as automation is concerned, it is very interesting. The whole process of mechanization and automation are in a way one and the same thing. But the process of mechanization was such that machines added to the human productivity. So when machines add to the human productivity, the productivity of human being increases. And that means that the human being is able to earn more income, he's better off, or his drudgeries are reduced, or he is in a position to work with increased flexibility, increased leisure hours, to pursue whatever activities you would like to pursue. The automation part is very interesting. When we have automation, slowly and gradually, the human effort and the human being himself will be made redundant in the whole production process. Now, when we talk about automation, there is a Oxford University study which says that in the next 10 years, 45% of the jobs that are currently engaging the people in USA will become redundant or they will become such that hardly a minor fraction of the population will be engaged in working. So automation is something which will be, uh, which will be in a way driving out the human being. Of course, at this point, we must remember that with automation, the productivity increases and in a way, I can say that the world today has enough technology 
enough know-how to feed the entire population of the world, enough resources, enough of abundance to ensure that everybody gets right education, everybody has a roof over the head, everybody gets clean drinking water and so on. So with the advance of technology, we have reached a point where we are in a position to give a dignified human life to all the people of the world. The problem is that the distributive mechanism is such that the fruits of abundance are not equally spread and the fruits of the abundance are yet to reach the poor people. And that is why when we talk about automation, the first thing that comes to the mind is that the first to be eliminated from the job market are the low skill jobs. People who are performing low skill jobs, they are in the biggest danger of losing their job, but that is not all. We shall see in the course of presentation that doctors, lawyers, and pilots, and many other jobs will be slowly changing its character because with the help of artificial intelligence, automation will change the entire uh, employment scenario in the world. Uh, we shall discuss this uh, with the help of some videos. Uh, and at the same time, I would also like to point out that the environmental concerns have become very important now than ever before because people have realized that we have just one earth to live on. So the, the, the environment that we have inherited from our parents, we should in a, be in a position to hand over it in a better condition to our next generation, rather than give the next generation polluted, dirty earth where survival of the species is at stake. Glaciers are melting, global warming is taking place, unseasonal rains are there. There are many examples. I need not elaborate on all this. The question is that as environmental concerns become more and more important, we will find jobs in that sector. The environmental concerns will, will motivate human beings, will motivate technocrats, bureaucrats, and policymakers to look for jobs in that sector where the human effort can control the damage already done to the environment and the human factor, the human beings can help to devise such technology whereby damage to the environment is minimum. So we can say that uh, recycling of the plastic is one area, cleaning up of the villages, cleaning up of the rivers is another area, finding out solution to urban sewage problem, urban uh, waste problem, dry waste and wet waste problem. These are the areas in which many job opportunities, many employment opportunities will open up. So we can safely say that the two, the two parameters that will change or that will define the futuristic employment perspective are automation aided by artificial intelligence, robotics, and so on, and the environmental concerns. Let us have a look at this video. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Brad Bethesda. Nice to meet you. Likewise. This is a humanoid robot, which means it looks, it talks, and it even acts, well, like a human. So does that mean it could take a human's job like mine? You better believe it. No, I'm not joking. It's not really. There's no denying robots and automation are increasingly part of our daily lives. Just look around the grocery store or the highway, or in the case of Robo Thespian here, even at the theater. Ma'am, the screen is not shared. Sorry? The screen is, screen is not shared. Screen sharing, ma'am. The video is not visible. Like some pretty scary warnings about the future of work. These robots will be able to do everything better than us. A recent study found up to 670,000 U.S. jobs were lost yes, to robots uh, between 1990 and 2007, and that number is likely to go up. A widely cited study from 2013 found nearly half of all jobs in the U.S. are in danger of being automated over the next 20 years. 
occupations that require repetitive and predictable tasks in transportation, logistics, and administrative support were especially high risk. And just think, robots don't need health benefits, vacation, or even sleep for that matter. But the debate robots, over whether on. robots will take over all of our jobs is by sharing, ma'am. You have to put it in. Well, the many economists argue no, automation will ultimately. We just can hear it. We can jobs. hear it. After all, someone has to program the robots, right? No. No, no, ma'am. Let's go back to the 1850s when trains were the most popular. Uh, not, the screen is not shared, ma'am. Locomotive engineers, railroad no, conductors, and no, ma'am. No, ma'am. We can just hear it. Percent. But that growth slowed in the early 1900s. Why? You guessed it. The automobile came along. Car mechanic and repairman jobs surged, even though railroad jobs began to disappear. And some companies say the same thing will happen when robots move into the marketplace. A survey of 20,000 employers. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Robert Testing. Nice to meet you. Is it no, ma'am. Uh, we cannot. Robot. The screen has to be shared, ma'am. Screen sharing. Well, like a human. So does that mean he could take a human's job, like mine? Anyway, let us proceed for the next slide. Yes, ma'am. Can you see me? Yes, ma'am. And our honorable chancellor, sir, has also joined. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, good morning, sir. And uh, let us, uh, there's something, some technical hitch here. So, I'm not able to share the screen. So, uh, anyway, uh, let us uh, go ahead. Uh, let me try it once again. Khabir also has the slide. Can he help me? Yes, I will just. Ma'am, Kabir is connecting to the slides. Yeah. How about now? How about now? Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Can you hear? Hi, I'm yes, Robert ma'am, we can see. Oh. Nice to meet you. Likewise. This is a humanoid robot, which means it looks, it talks, and it even acts, well, like a human. So does that mean it could take a human's job like mine? You better believe it. No, I'm only joking, not really. There's no denying robots and automation are increasingly part of our daily lives. Just look around the grocery store, or the highway, or in the case of Robothespian here, even at the theater. I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. The rise of robots has led to some pretty scary warnings about the future of work. The robots will be able to do everything better than us. A recent study found up to 670,000 U.S. jobs were lost to robots between 1990 and 2007, and that number is likely to go up. A widely cited study from 2013 found nearly half of all jobs in the U.S. are in danger of being automated over the next 20 years. Occupations that require repetitive and predictable tasks in transportation, logistics, and administrative support were especially high risk. And just think, robots don't need health benefits, vacation, or even sleep for that matter. But the debate over whether robots will take over all of our jobs is by no means settled. Many economists argue automation will ultimately create new jobs. After all, someone has to program the robots, right? Let's go back to the 1850s, when trains were the most popular mode of transportation. This chart shows the number of locomotive engineers, railroad conductors, and brakemen increasing by nearly 600%. But that growth slowed in the early 1900s. Why? You guessed it, the automobile came along. Car mechanic and repairman jobs surged, 
even though railroad jobs began to disappear. And some companies say the same thing will happen when robots move into the marketplace. A survey of 20,000 employers from 42 countries found that the IT, customer service, and advanced manufacturing industries will add workers over the next two years as a result of automation. It's hard to imagine that robots could replicate human characteristics like empathy or compassion that are required in many jobs. I mean, would you really want a robot as your nurse, babysitter, or teacher? But even if robots don't take our jobs entirely, research shows they will significantly change day-to-day -day tasks in the workplace. This is particularly a problem for lower-skilled workers who aren't able to retrain for new jobs. They might get stuck with lower wages in a world with more robots, and that could make income inequality even worse. These guys are making a lot of things uncertain right now, but one thing that's clear is skills training is required if we hope to get along with friends like them in the workplace. I think we're gonna get along just fine. Hey everyone, it's Elizabeth and Robo Seskin here. Thanks so much for watching our video. You can check out more of our videos all the time, including one about universal basic income over here on our YouTube page. While you're at it, leave us some ideas in the comment section and subscribe to our channel. See you later. Okay, so it was a it was an interesting video, and as we discussed, that automation and environmental concern. These are the two areas, these are the two parameters that will change the futuristic job perspective. So uh, uh, as we saw here, the, the low skill jobs are the first one to go. But not just that. We have all heard about uh, autopiloted planes. Or oh, forget about autopiloted planes. Let us talk about uh, self-driven cars. Now it is estimated that uh, in the next three, four years in USA, at least 40% of the cars will be uh, electrically operated and it will be self-driven car. So getting into a, uh, driving a car would be almost like getting into an elevator. You just uh, get into the car, you press the button and the vehicle will take you wherever you want to go. Trials are going on, no doubt. It is not that they have the full proof technology. The point here is that the auto-driven cars are likely to make less mistakes than the human driven cars because of the precision in technology. And so this technological advance is something which is going to happen. The Uber drivers, the Ola drivers, those who are managing commercial vehicles, uh, they will all be out of the job. Similarly, we have seen that the newspapers, the publishing industry and uh, the magazine industry has also taken a hit because of the spread of internet technology. So we find that the publishers will be out of job, not just that, but even the middle level management cadre will also face the difficulty because the robots, the artificial intelligence can do the job that they're doing in a much better way. And just imagine, instead of having to uh, look at uh, the leave applications of the employees, to think about their pay rise, and to talk about the different types of leave that they're entitled to and the health problems, uh, the union activities, all this will cease to exist when the robots take over. Robots can work for 24 hours in a day. They are not tired. And once you've invested in the robotic technology, once you've invested in a particular robot, then that in a, in a year or two, you can reap the benefits, you can recover the cost, and the rest of the time, the robot gives you totally free service, fully reliable service, no, uh, no tantrums of the employees and so on. So this technology is coming. And uh, I'm sure uh, people must have noticed that during this period of lockdown, the government has announced uh, part of the privatization of railways. Railway privatization has come to India. We have also seen that the bank merger has taken place. Now, it, there is not much time to discuss the economic aspects of all this. But the larger perspective, looking at the larger perspective, one realizes that basically they are trying to cut down on the operating cost. The operating cost is being minimized, which means the banks will not recruit any more people, which also means that the railways will be managed with fewer staff, 
These are just two examples. But in all the sphere, the, the, the emphasis is on the technological, on technological um, usefulness. And the technology provides you with the 100% safe model. So why not adopt the technology? So that question has come. At the same time, the jobs of travel agents is no longer required. Our smartphone is capable of doing so many things. The smartphone is capable of, uh, uh, I mean, everybody knows that. I need not talk about it much in detail. Not just that, but even the lawyers. A, a, robot, a robot which is made to act like a lawyer can give you perfect advice in a fraction of a time that a human, labor, a human lawyer can give you advice. Because the robot at the tip of the tongue and, and the eye tip of the tongue is a human expression, but at the click of the mouse, a robot can have access to all the previous cases of the particular law that we are discussing and the robot can come out with the advice. So this list is endless. And as I said, on the YouTube, on Google, if you search for uh, videos, it say which 15 jobs will be made redundant. They are available. Which 15 jobs have a good prospect after 20 years from now, they are also available. I'm not replicating all those because the material is readily available on the Google. But as I said, I'm trying to draw the basic framework. And if you have a look at the video of uh, Harari, a uh, promising author, uh, uh, then you can, we can have a clear idea as to what I'm trying to say. Please enjoy this video. Nobody really knows how the world and the job market would look like in 2040. Hence, nobody knows what to teach young people today. Consequently, it is likely that much of what you currently learn at school will be irrelevant by the time you're 40. So what should you focus on? My best advice is to focus on developing your mental balance and your emotional intelligence. Traditionally, life has been divided into two main parts, a period of learning followed by a period of working. In the first part of your life, you built a stable identity and acquired personal and professional skills. In the second part of life, you relied on your identity and skills to navigate the world, earn a living and contribute to society. But by 2040, this traditional model will become obsolete. And the only way for humans to stay in the game will be to keep learning throughout their lives and to reinvent themselves again and again, even at the age of 50. Yet change is usually stressful. And after a certain age, most people don't like to change. When you're 10 years old, your entire life is change, whether you like it or not. Your body is changing, your mind is changing, your relationships are changing. Everything is in flux. You're busy inventing yourself. By the time you're 50, you don't want change. You want stability. But in the 21st century, you won't be able to enjoy that luxury. If you try to hold on to some stable identity, some stable job, some stable worldview, you will be left behind and the world will fly by you with a whoosh. So people will need to be extremely resilient and mentally balanced to sail through this never ending storm and to deal with very high levels of stress. Yes, so we just heard uh, Yuval Noah Harari, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And as he very rightly points out, getting a degree or being a graduate or being a postgraduate or for that matter, even being a doctorate is not the end of studies. In fact, it is the beginning of the studies and all throughout our life, we have to continue to reinvent in ourselves, we have to continue to learn new things. And that is that has an important bearing on the system of education. 
we have to motivate our students to learn more and to learn till the last breath we have to create that environment in the minds of the students where students are motivated to reinvent themselves because it is possible that they may have to change change their careers because the jobs that they were doing have become redundant so it is possible that every 10 years a person may be required to uh, improvise himself improvise herself and opt for a new job so that kind of flexibility that kind of capacity to be resilient that kind of capacity to be working as part of the team is very necessary so the focus on these aspects is very essential but of course we shall have a look at this particular aspect nobody really knows how the world and the job market now like look at this slide from science order prioritizing job skills over college degree in government hiring even the tesla guy the elon musk has said that those who apply for tesla jobs they need not have any formal degree now there is a shift one one shift has taken place in the job market which has not yet come to india however the definite shift is that people want the employers want persons with skills to join the institutions rather than persons with bookish knowledge and degrees so what is important now is that we teach skills to the people and at, at this at this juncture let me tell you that a person who is working as a cashier in the bank has a less chance of retaining his job than a plumber who is managing the masonry work of your bathroom a plumber has a better chance people who maintain people who are involved in maintenance they have a better chance of retaining the job than the people who are doing repetitive jobs which can be easily performed by a robot so when we come to this conclusion that automation is going to change the futuristic employment market let us look at what are the things which a robot cannot do because uh, when we talk about the employment situation in 2050 we must find out the gap areas where a human effort is essential where human beings have a special carved out niche specially carved out domain where they can operate so let us have a look at this video it turns out the jobs of the future will be those jobs that cannot be done by artificial intelligence and robots and there are huge gaps in what a robot can do robots have very bad eyesight they see lines circles squares but they don't understand that these lines circles squares make up a face or a chair or a cup pattern recognition is one of the big problems second common sense they don't understand the simplest things about human behavior about the world they don't know that water is wet they don't know that strings can pull but strings cannot push so the two jobs that will thrive in the future and the two sets of jobs that will be destroyed are as follows among blue collar jobs repetitive jobs are going to be wiped out obliterated this means jobs in the automobile industry textile industry that are purely repetitive are in danger non repetitive jobs in blue collar work will thrive garbage men sanitation people gardeners police construction workers every job is different they will survive in white collar work it defies common sense the people who will be thrown out of work are middlemen low level accountants bookkeepers agents tellers middlemen the friction of capitalism are going to be obliterated so who will benefit among white collar workers workers who engage in intellectual capitalism what is intellectual capitalism it involves common sense in other words creativity imagination leadership analysis telling a joke writing a script writing a book doing science realize that england said tony blair derives more revenue from rock music rock music than it does the coal industry 
because we're making the transition from commodity-based capital like coal to intellectual capital like rock and roll. Well, uh, it is a revelation that England has more income by selling rock music than by selling coal. In other words, uh, the artistic pursuits and the pursuits where human element is required, where aesthetics is involved, where symphony is required, where making sense of a meaningless data is required, there robots cannot do the job and we have to rely on human beings. So uh, it is clear that uh, we have to uh, we have to shift our educational institutions in the favor of such kinds of activities. Now, this brings us to the next topic, and that is the idea of new kind of mind that is needed. Kabir, can you play the next slide, please? Kabir? Kabir, can you hear me? Ma'am, ma'am, he's, he's playing. He's playing. Yeah, yeah. Trying to. Yes, the theory of mind, because of automation, new theories are required. So now let us look at the new next slide. This is very interesting. A whole new mind. My right brainers will rule the future can by you, Daniel Pink. Can you hear this? Our brains are connected with new hemispheres. The left is all can hear it. and analysis can see, and see? helps us get high as No, ma'am. Uh, Kabir's, uh, I'll, I'll request right. Kabir to it's speak up. Yeah, I'm also trying it. Then okay. Kabir to stop it. I'm trying. Yes, yes. Uh, Kabir, you can stop it. Now, a whole new mind. No, ma'am. Uh, not right yet. Will rule the future the by no, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. A whole new mind. My right brainers will I mean, rule the future ma by Daniel. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Our brains are divided into two hemispheres. The left is all about logic and analysis and helps us get high SAT scores. The right is all about design and emotion and helps us get art. Over the past century, we have been focusing much more on left than right brain thinking as we had to make sense of an explosion of information converted into knowledge and put that knowledge to work. Engineers, computer programmers, and other knowledge workers led the evolution. But success led to abundance in automation, making it less important how products are made and more important how they are sold. Right-brainers can give meaning to products through design, empathy, and storytelling. Right-brain thinking took the back seat during the information age, but in the conceptual age, right brain thinking will become increasingly important. Those that understand what Pink calls the six aptitudes of this type of thinking 
and harness their power are going to thrive in the emerging world. The right brain will be at least as important as the left brain, giving rise to a whole new mind. Yeah, let us, uh, we have seen how right brain, which uh, deals with uh, creative aspects, which is neglected in the present system of education, is going to be more important in the coming days than the left brain. Now let us discuss a few uh, parameters. For example, design will be more important, not just the function. Now if a robot has to design the mobile, the robot is, will just ensure that whatever technical features are required, they are there. But the robot will not think about the design, the aesthetic sense, the look, the feel. Actually, whenever we, uh, whenever we use a commodity, we would like that the commodity is uh, aesthetic looking, it is nice to touch, nice to feel, and so on. Next is a question of story. Now, we are interested in a story and not an argument in the sense that when you when the production is abundant, marketing is important and marketing, every marketeer tells a story. So it is not just enough to have logical arguments, which a robot can do very well, but we should be able to weave together the arguments in the form of a story. Now, let me just illustrate this by telling a short, short story. It is a Zen story. Uh, I'm trying to tell it in a very brief manner. Uh, in Japan's... Uh, Japan's medieval Japan, the tradition was that all the Zen masters had the small temple and any Zen master can walk in. And if that person who walks in challenges the owners of the temple for a debate, they are supposed to go for a debate. And if the traveler, if the person who has come, he wants to, wins the debate, then he becomes the owner of the temple and the original people just leave. So one day, one such traveler's traveler walks in. Now, this particular temple is managed by two brothers. One is very enlightened, uh, very intelligent, and totally a Zen master. The other one uh, is a little stupid person, and he has just one eye. Now, when the traveler comes, the, the senior one, the more enlightened one, was very busy. So he told his younger brother that, why don't you take care of him? I'm coming in, in some time. But don't talk too much. Be silent. Okay, then both of them sit, sit down in silence. Then the traveler says he raises one finger. And when he raises one finger, that man, the, the one-eyed man was very angry. He raises two fingers. Then the traveler raises three fingers. And the one-eyed man raises a fist. By this time, the traveler is willing to withdraw and he goes to the elder brother and says that your younger brother is very intelligent and he is a completely enlightened person. So the elder brother asks, tell me the story, what happened? So the traveler says that I raised one finger to indicate that there is one Gautam Buddha. Then he raised two fingers, which means that is Gautam Buddha and his teachings, there are two things. Then I raised three fingers indicating that Gautam Buddha, his teachings and his followers, together they constitute Buddhism. But he raises one single fist indicating that all this is just one, this is Buddhism. So I was amazed at his level of enlightenment and so I'm leaving, your brother is a wonderful person. By the time he leaves, the younger one, the stupid one, one-eyed man, he just comes running and asks his elder brother, where that man went away? I want to teach him a lesson. So he says, what happened? You have just won the argument and why are you so angry? So that man says, no, 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 he insulted me. So the elder brother says, tell me the story. So the younger one, the one-eyed man says that, well, I have one eye and I'm very sad about it. But look at the audacity of the traveler. He raises one single finger and tells me that you have just one eye. So I raised 
two, two fingers because I didn't want to be impolite to him. So I said, well, I, I have one eye, but you may have two eyes. So I sort of, I want you to be polite. So I pointed out that you have two eyes, but look at the man. He says, three, he raised three fingers, indicating that between two of us, we have just three eyes. So I was very angry and I showed him the fist. I wanted to give him a punch, but I just waited because I was supposed to carry on your orders. Now look at this. One person interpretation of the event. The event is the same. One finger, two fingers, three fingers, and one fist. Event is the same, but the interpretation is different. So this is the part that can be played by human being interpretation. Similarly, about symphony, empathy, play, meaning, these are all very uh, interesting uh, examples and very many interesting stories are there. But as I can see on the, my computer screen, the time is 11.52. So I should try to wind up the discussion so that there is some room for questions. So let me just try to wind up. What is important here is that we know that the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Because these days, Google knows it all. All the knowledge is there with Google. You name it and they have it. They can produce knowledge much faster than human beings can. But wisdom, no. Google cannot give you wisdom. And as a very famous uh, line is there, that uh, knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit. And wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. So this is the difference between knowledge and wisdom. And for the wisdom part, we have to use our right brain, creativity, aesthetics, wholeness, storytelling, synthesis, symphony. These are the important things. And these are the qualities which we must try to generate through the education system. So our future systems of education, future institutions of the education should keep these things in mind in order to be meaningful and relevant. Here comes the question of augmented reality, augmented reality and uh, virtual reality. Well, there, is a, a few, there are a few things to say, but uh, I would like to leave some question, our question answer time. So I'm not uh, discussing much in detail. Brain to computer interface. Uh, those of us who have seen PK, uh, know how he try, how an alien tries to learn the language. Just when he touches the hand of a person, the entire knowledge of language is transmitted to his brain. In future, we will have some such chips which we can attach to the brain and the entire knowledge may be transferred to the brain. So it is possible to transfer the knowledge to the brain, but for the wisdom part, we have to rely only on human wisdom and human creativity. And that is why I feel that to be relevant, to be important and to serve the purpose, the future institutions and the institutions which are existing now to retain their relevance, they should be able to develop these qualities. And it is possible that if we develop such qualities, we will be able to bypass the technology, we'll be able to not bypass the technology, but we'll be able to run faster than the technology and we will stay relevant because skills-based education, value-based education, the human qualities like kindness, compassion, uh, empathy, these are the things which are which will be the need of future, taking care of the senior people, taking care of the elderly people, taking care of sick people, taking care of babies, all these are areas where automation cannot drive out the human labor. So we have to be creative in imaginative in finding out what jobs will stay and how do we train our people? Because uh, as the trend suggests, slowly and gradually, abundance is going to come. Abundance is already there. Technically, today we have enough resources to feed the entire population of the world. But whether it has created happiness. To create happiness, 
will require a certain kind of value orientation. And before I end the talk, uh, I would like to say that uh, everybody has heard the story of uh, the Midas touch. I, I want to tell you in brief that there was a king called Midas and Midas was a person who um, was so greedy about wealth that he asked God to give him a boon that whatever he touches becomes gold. And he was so happy when God granted him the boon. His palace became full of gold, the tables, the chairs, the clothes, whatever he touched became gold. After some time, his daughter walks in and she hugs her father. She turns into gold. Now imagine the person has all the wealth in the world, but no human companionship. The daughter, the beloved daughter has turned into gold. He cannot eat anything because whatever he touches becomes gold. The point here is that materialistic pleasure, materialistic abundance, uh, maybe there it is required in certain cases, but ultimately it is the human touch and the human values of kindness that helps nurture a society. So this concern will guide us in future and the educational institutions of 2050 will be focused on this. They will not be focused only on granting degrees, but they will be focused on developing skills, developing certain attributes. So that is all that I have to say from my end. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Ma'am, it was an eye-opening session. Uh, like, you know, we have got so many comments, uh, like, you know, citing that, uh, you know, it's, it's such an informative session and we are, we are really thankful that, like, you know, you had put in this uh, lecture in such a short time. Uh, but, uh, ma'am, there are a few questions. Uh, one, like, you know, you, uh, most of them you have answered during your lecture, but uh, still, ma'am, there's, there's one question that has been repeatedly asked in this session. Are these yes. prospective skills for employment in developing countries like India? W what are the prospective skills of employment, ma'am, that we must pursue? Like, you know, or, or, or like, you know, educational institutions should uh, come up with mainly. Yes, that's a very important question because uh, what we need from our perspective is this. Now, uh, there are many videos which uh, list out all these things, but what I feel what are important skills are, that we should teach teamwork, we should teach uh, uh, how to be flexible, we should teach the basic skills to work with the hand and not just bookish knowledge. And we should prepare our students with some knowledge of history, geography, sociology, anthropology and everything, but not too much of specialization whereby they cannot reinvent themselves and pursue other activities. Having said this, in a country like India, we will need technologists who will increase the productivity of the farm. They can improve uh, organic farming. They can produce uh, better fruits and better uh, preserve the fruits in a longer time and so on and so forth. So agricultural sector has immense possibility to offer. And India is also known as the technical uh, power engine. So in the field of computer science, we have ample opportunities because we'll have so many robots and robotic engineering, but there'll be somebody required to take care of the robots, to write the algorithms and so on. So in the computer, there is uh, an important uh, opening and there are many other such things which we can discuss uh, in future. Thank you, ma'am. So ma'am, like, you know, uh, universities and edu higher educational institutions must, must have a multidisciplinary curriculum. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And, 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 and must enhance and uh, motivate their students to be more creative. More creative. <laughs> yep, put it very uh, well. Thank you. Yes. Ma'am, uh, we would now like to request uh, Dr. Rashmi Rekha Borua to kindly present uh, the vote of thanks. Dr. Rashmi Rekha Borua. Uh, we are not being able to hear you, Rashmi. We are not being able to hear you. Did you just speak once so that we will be able to know? No. no. I 
I think Rashmi, if you can uh, take off your 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 phones, I think I would remove the earphones from the computer. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes we can hear you. We can hear you now. Okay, so sorry. Ah, uh, a very good afternoon to respected Professor Alaka Sharma, ma'am, Honorary Director, International Center for Gandhian Studies, USTM. Mr. Mohabul Haq Sir, Honorable Chancellor, University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya. Panelist, participants of today's webinar, ladies and gentlemen. In the beginning, I would like to express my profound gratitude to our esteemed speaker of today's webinar lecture, Professor Alaka Sarma, ma'am, for sharing her knowledge regarding today's topic. We have realized that the future of education is all about the strengthening and incorporating student-centric learning. Therefore, teachers have to adopt personalized learning and teaching patterns to cope up with the changing scenario. Ma'am has explained very well about automation and technological development in the coming years. She has also explained that how virtual reality and augmented reality technologies will become so strong that it will influence every sector in the world, including the higher education sector. Ma'am has showed us few videos that help us to understand and visualize our coming future. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for your very interesting and knowledgeable lecture. Thank you, ma'am. I would also like to convey my heartfelt thanks to our honorable chancellor, Mr. M. Hawk, sir, without whose support, we would not have been able to organize this webinar. So our beliefs that flexibility in learning will be the key word that governs the forthcoming tendency of imparting education to students in the coming years. Thank you, sir, for organizing this USTM webinar series. I'm very sure that all the participants have learned many new things from each and every session of this series of webinar. Thank you once again, sir. We are extremely grateful to Dr. Middul Hajarika, sir, Vice Chancellor, USTM, Professor Sohail Sabir, sir, Pro Vice Chancellor, USTM, Registrar, Academic Registrar, Deputy Registrar, Director Student Affairs, OST, and all the faculty members for giving us the moral support and continuous guidance to conduct this webinar. We are extremely grateful to all the panelists present here for smooth functioning of the webinar. We are grateful to each and every participants for attending this webinar. I would like to mention here that even though many changes will arise by 2050, in higher education, but I'm sure as with most development, we teachers and students together can drive these changes in higher education in a positive direction through foresight, smart thinking, and hardworking. I would also like to say thank you to all the administrative staff and technical staff for smooth functioning of this webinar. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rashmi Rekhaburwa. Uh, we would now like to like you know uh, announce that the next uh, USTM uh, webinar lecture series in the next uh, lecture episode uh, we will have uh, Professor Abdul Mannan sir he is the former chairman University Grand Commission Republic of Bangladesh on the 13th of July at 11 a.m. we will hope to see everyone uh, on during that session also like you know we had some queries during the session regarding the e-certificates some of the participants have not received it we will ensure that all the e-certificates are been uh, like you know, mailed to your respective email IDs as soon as possible Alaka ma'am thank you so much uh, for enlightening us with this wonderful session and so we hope is, to hear thank you, you, from you again, ma'am. I'm sorry, some technical glitches happened. But uh, still, ma'am, it was a very that, informative session. Let's come to the much better. Let's yes, see. But, but still, like, you know, we, we are having uh, queries coming that, ma'am, please extend the session more. <laughs> I, mean, I, am I am ready. I thought the participants would be bored by the time. Uh, no, 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 no. They, no, they were, they were, they were some very good videos also. It was very motivating. Right. We have yes. learned many things, ma'am. Uh, so, ma'am, uh, like we, we will be seeing you again. Let's hope so. And for the participant, we will be sending your e-certificates in your respective email IDs. Uh, please bear with us because of the technical pro pro uh, problems of uh, like, you know, the lockdown. Uh, we are not being able to do a faster job because of like, you know, we are all at home, sitting at home and doing our work, but trying our level best uh, to come up as soon as possible with more innovative ideas. Thank you so much. Good day. Thank you. Thank you.